Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for returning so promptly uh, from the coffee break. Uh, I could see there were lots of fantastic conversations uh, going on uh, over the, uh, the cake and the tea, uh, which I hope to avail myself of later. Um, we come now to our first in conversation uh, with uh, session of the event, uh, and it's a particularly pertinent one, uh, pertinent one given the importance uh, of trust and reputation to uh, the industry. Uh, as I think some people uh, have said in the past, uh, ultimately your most important asset, uh, whether you are a company, an individual, or a state, uh, is your reputation uh, and the trust that people have in you, and that is particularly important uh, with our industry. And so I'm delighted uh, that we have uh, a terrific expert uh, to uh, run through uh, where we stand uh, at the moment, uh, and I'm delighted, therefore, to introduce Carol McNaughton Nichols, associate partner at Britain Thinks, uh, a fantastic fantastic polling firm uh, that the City UK has been working with for many years. Uh, and Carol will be in conversation with City UK's Managing Director of Public Affairs, Policy and Research, Emma Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name's Emma Reynolds. I'm the Managing Director for Public Affairs, Policy and Research at the City UK. And I'm delighted to introduce this session with Britain Thinks on the trust and reputation of our industry. We commissioned some recent uh, research earlier this year of Britain Thinks, and we've been working with the UK's leading uh, research uh, company for the last eight years, tracking the, uh, the trust and reputation of our industry. And as you all know, the City UK's one of our strategic objectives is to continue to improve uh, the trust and reputation uh, of our industry, uh, not only with the public, but also, but also with uh, key important political and non-political stakeholders uh, who have an influence on, on political decision making. And I'm particularly delighted to be in conversation with Dr. Carol McNaughton Nichols, who's a regular attendee at our conferences, but it's particular delight to welcome Carol back home, because um, Carol grew up in Scotland and is an alumnus of both the University of Edinburgh and the University of Glasgow. And as Miles said, Carol, Carol is a leading expert in everything that is market research and insight, and we're delighted to have you with us, Carol. Carol will do a presentation uh, of the research, but then I will come to the audience. Uh, so please do be thinking of questions you want to put to Carol, and uh, those of you online as well, I will be um, putting questions uh, from the iPad to Carol uh, later in the session. So thank you. Over to you, Carol. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. It is lovely to be here this morning. Um, thank you, Miles and, and Emma, for those lovely introductions as well. It is an echoey room. I hope you can, you can hear me OK. Uh, hopefully today I certainly won't have to worry about my accent uh, being clear to everyone. So it's lovely to be here in Edinburgh. I, I, I now live in London, but it's, it's great to be back. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to present some new research that we just conducted. And this is perhaps for those of you who are, who are not research nerds, the slightly boring bit, but I will, I will outline how we did the research so you're, you're clear on where the data has come from before I get into the really interesting point of talking through the findings. So as Emma mentioned, we've been conducting research for the City UK for a number of years, tracking the reputation of the industry. We did a similar piece of research last year, so we've been able to reflect on where things may have changed. And this year, what we did was in-depth interviews with policymakers. It was a, a breakdown here of, of, of who they were. We tried to make sure we get a good spread. We did a nationally representative survey of the UK public. And as well as tracking key questions that we have tracked every year for a number of years, we asked about key themes that are particularly pertinent this year. Having said that, we, we did the field work over sort of, I think, May and over the summer. And I think since we did the interviews, we've had about three prime ministers. So things have been changing fairly quickly, uh, but, we'll, but we'll talk about that as we go through it. So the context, what's been influencing policymakers and the public? Actually, I, I always think it's good to sit in on, on all the sessions when, you, when you're talking. And I was really struck today already about how many themes have come up, which we're also going to hear in this presentation that we heard from policymakers. But one thing we also can't ignore, and I don't think any of you could ignore, is the impact of, of rising costs. And that has been a real backdrop to this year. And we do our own research. This isn't the research that we did for the City UK. We do our own research as well at Britain Thinks. And we've been tracking how the, the public feel about rising costs. Well, I think it's quite interesting about this slide. We can see we asked them through three waves of research, how worried are you worried about some of these issues? And the cost of living increase since March 
People have been worried about 90% of the population. I often ask if people think this has increased this year and everyone thinks concern would have increased. Actually, the public have been living with concerns about rising costs most of this year, and that's a really important backdrop to their views. And you can see also there's a range of other issues that haven't gone away. It's not as if concern about NHS funding, climate change, crime, it's not that they've disappeared, they're still there, but the additional context is rising costs. In our own research, we also asked the public, who do they think is, is, is responsible for these rising costs? And whilst they do recognise a difficult external context, as you can see, there is a widespread sense of, of the government being part of, the, of this, this situation. Now, I've been doing research now for 20 years, so I think what strikes me is quite different from post-2008, when I have to say, for many years, the banks always got held up by the public as the people who were to blame and perhaps became sometimes a scapegoat. What we've seen this year is actually that's not the case, and it's, it's, it's a number of different issues that the public are concerned about. They're realising it's a number of different issues, driving rising costs, but there is quite a lot of um, a sense of, that the government could or should have been doing more, and almost a lack of recognition of the support that the government has given. And a final context point is I think when we're interviewing policymakers and talking about policymakers, it's always really important to remember that they have so many different influences. They've got so much going on. Their own regional context, the international context, their personal experience, their professional background, the policies of their party. There's a, there's a lot of information that they're being exposed to every day. So four key findings I'm gonna talk through. I'm gonna go through these quite quickly so I'll go through each in detail in a moment. But we've seen a sort of, if I could use the expression, leveling out of, uh, of, of the positivity around the reputation of the industry this year. But long-standing drivers of a positive reputation remain the same. There is very little argument that the industry is not beneficial to the economy. But the public do believe, and so do policymakers, there's work to be done to really effectively communicate some other aspects of the work that the industry is doing that are felt to be vitally important. So the first point then, we saw last year, I think a, an impact of the pandemic and the public feeling and then policymakers feeling that the industry responded really well in that context. We saw a kind of rise in, in positivity last year, which is now kind of leveled out. We show these, we do these every year, sort of word clouds of how both policymakers and the public describe the FRPS industry. And you can see from policymakers, a lot of positive, it's world leading, it's innovative. Now, these are the words that they are coming up with. But when we ask the public, they fall back more on sort of reputational tropes, which I think are quite hard to escape. But some is positive, reliable, trustworthy, sort of money, fair enough. But some of these more, more negative aspects. And what I heard also this year from policymakers was they just were a little bit less sure of exactly what the industry had been doing. Last year, they had some really clear narratives about what they felt the industry had been doing and, and, and the benefit that it had brought. Now, this is when we show some of the tracking that we've been doing each year. The dark, darker the green lines, the, the closer to this year is. So the darkest green at the end is 2022. And as you can see, reputationally, in terms of the, how favorable they feel towards the different parts of the industry or trust different parts of the industry, has slightly dropped this year compared to last year. But we're also seeing it quite flat. It's not, it does not varied a huge amount over the years, but it has slightly dropped this year. Now, this is not, this is quite, a, I see there's a lot of information on this slide, it's not always best practice, but I thought, given the audience today, a bit of a regional breakdown would also be interesting. And Scotland's out there on the side in blue, if anyone's looking, looking for Scotland. Um, although there's sort of limited differences, you can see some increase, decrease across regions, it's quite difficult to extrapolate from that in any, any clear patterns. I think what you can see, though, interestingly, is that this is about trust, the extent to which there's, there's trust in these aspects of the industry, that... In Scotland in particular, trust in my own bank is quite high. And in the devolved nations, trust in my insurance provider and my own bank is quite high. And we always see that, actually, that the aspects of the industry people have a direct relationship with, their bank, their providers, come out much more positively, which I think is actually a good thing, indicating probably they're having a, a positive relationship where they have those, those touch points. So that's an overview of reputation at the moment. What is driving the positivity? Well, what we keep hearing is that there are well-established strengths and these continue to drive a relatively positive reputation amongst policymakers. You are seen as a driver of the economy, you are seen as world leading, and you're seen as a significant employer. And that's all really positive. And we find that large proportions of the public feel the same way. Over 50% agreeing with statements such as FRPS companies in the UK bring valuable income to the UK economy. Slightly fewer than 
half agreeing so much with the world leading aspect, perhaps that's because they're less familiar with the industry, but still almost half agreeing, for example, that the UK status as a world leading financial centre is a matter of national pride. So they're aligning with policymakers to some extent. And again, looking at the data by regions, we see a bit of a mixed picture. Standing out in the, the dark green line of, of being world leading is that perhaps that's coming through a bit more clearly in London. But again, we're seeing a sort of mix in terms of it being the driver of economy, but all sitting around sort of 50 into 60, 65%. And so there's a bit of a mixed pattern regionally that could be interesting to dig into in a bit more detail. But generally, the public do see some of these positives around being a driver of the economy. Now, something that's been spoken about this morning already, and this came from policymakers, is the fact that the aspects of the industry they really praise is innovation, fintech, for example, some proactive implementations of sanctions, some engagement with public affairs. And I conducted the interviews before COP27, but some of the responses that the industry had made in post-COP26 and the narratives around that also seem to be really positive from policymakers. However, there is always work to be done. And a clear narrative that I kept hearing in the interviews, and I think we've seen come through from the data with the public, is that some of that work is really about helping connect policymakers and connect the public and connect their constituents with the regional impact that the industry can have and with aspects of consumer protection, for example. People are not saying that these necessarily don't happen, particularly policymakers often recognise it happens, but there's sometimes a lack of true connection of the benefit that that has to a local area for that actually means for their constituents or a real knowledge of, of what is actually happening. So policymakers also tend to have stories that they've heard from their constituents. And that's often the, the lens through which they talk to me about the industry. And they have some long-standing views about the industry and, and some key issues that they feel they'd like to either know more about or, or hear more about or see more being done. And I was really struck by the, the sessions this morning, how much this aligns with what is already being spoken about. And that's really positive. So the first is that investment is still residually and seem to be London-centric. Now, that's okay. The, the City of London is seen to be a real success story. To use a sort of certain phrase, no one wants it to level down in London. But although there is huge recognition that many jobs are outside London, and that's, that's a positive story, and I think it's a part of the work that the City UK has done, that policymakers are really clear there are jobs outside London. There is still just this sense, but is it actually quite concentrated in the South East? Do they really know what, what's, what's going on regionally? Second point, which I think we've heard a lot about this morning, coming through from policymakers, is that hiring policies are still considered to be exclusive or elitist. Can more be done to, to benefit all the different types of people that make up the people of the UK, the different regions, the different types of skill sets and backgrounds that people have? The third, it's vitally important, it's why it's in the middle, is thinking about the impact of cost of living increases. And, and, and we heard from policymakers, again, something we heard this morning, they'd really like to see the industry step up and help people with their financial resilience, with financial education. And a fourth issue they, they discussed, wanting to know more about or having concerns about, was a feeling that perhaps there could be more support for SMEs or investments, a, a feeling amongst some policymakers that some startups have to look elsewhere, for example. And you can see, again, some, some statements that they made about backing that up. And finally, Although innovation is praised as a positive, there is also some concerns about unfettered innovation and how we have to make sure that we manage innovation carefully. Again, I mean, we kind of now know this year what's happened with crypto at the moment, but examples given of that being crypto assets and the need to, to not only embrace innovation, but think about this, the balances and the controls and the potential risks of innovation as well. Two further issues, which again, I think really align with some of the themes this, this morning that were highlighted by policymakers of where they, they want to continue to see focus and, and hear more about and understand more about is green finance and financial crime. And so there's, a, I think, a range of issues that we were already working on that you know is aligned with policymakers' in, interests. Now, the fourth key point is that there's a sense that when, when it does well, the industry is felt to do really well, it could be communicated more effectively to enhance your reputation. So often the policymakers I interviewed were not necessarily saying, I don't think they do these things, or I don't think they care about these things, but that I'm not quite sure I understand how it really benefits my constituents, or that I quite understand enough about it, or that enough is said about it or shouted about it, even if they do know that it happens. And this provides some evidence of this from their, from their own sort of voices. 
as you see in the middle, you know, the CSR work, I don't think it's well known. They, they've made a huge transition recently for the EU, for example. Do people know how much work that's been? Others say, saying, you know, interestingly, last year, some of the, the policymakers I interviewed said that maybe they shouldn't have got too much uh, credit for mortgage holidays, but this year saying maybe they should have shouted more about that. So there's always different aspects of feedback, but certainly a sense that more could be done to make sure these messages of what you're doing is really landing. And again, demonstrating how the industry feeds into regional growth and supports consumers is a way to enhance reputation, to enhance trust. And again, some evidence here, people talking about, I know this happens, but I don't think other people know or perhaps things can be overly complicated. How can we really help people in these times of need? Or we've seen how well the industry can respond in the pandemic. What are they going to do now? How are they going to step up now? So thinking perhaps next year, what might be the narrative? What will be the, the thing that the industry has done to step up and change? So what does all this mean for the future? Well, uh, a number of things. I think first of all, Business as usual, reputationally, seems potentially sort of fairly neutral. We're seeing over the many years that we've been tracking, it kind of stays the same, but maybe that's not a bad thing. Some of that is quite positive. If you see the level of trust in my own banks, my own in in insurers, is that a bad thing? It's perhaps fairly neutral. But I would say, and I'm saying all to, to all of my clients at the moment, this is tumultuous times. Reputation can quickly change. Some of the policymakers I spoke to referred back to 2008. Things can quickly change if things go wrong. You don't want to be a scapegoat, so can we really step up to think about um, negating any of those risks? But you're right, reputationally, perhaps you are where you are, and it's not negative. Policymakers have a huge amount of respect for the contribution that the industry makes. The second implication is to meet policymakers where they are, not necessarily where you think or or want them to be. And to that first slide I showed about how they have so much going on in their heads, so many sources of information they're grappling with. I don't think they can have enough information that really clearly crystallizes to them the way in which investment, for example, in regions is actually helping the people that are in their constituency or the people of their region. Because ultimately growth is great and hearing about investment is great for them, but they need to know who is this benefiting? How is this benefiting the people that I'm serving? So, make sure those messages are landing really effectively. And the third implication is that positive drivers of industry reputation, which are already there, you are already recognized as contributing to the UK economy of being world leading. These positive drivers are only enhanced when the industry is leading with justice and social good. And just to end, I will just paraphrase Martin Lewis, who I, I, I heard uh, was, was, had been talking a, in a week or, week or so ago. He'd been asked, um, how can certain sectors, how can they increase trust in them in these difficult times? And I believe his answer was, well, be trustworthy. So it seems quite simple, but we know there's actually a lot of complex priorities, issues, issues here to grapple with that we've had policymakers want to know more about. But I think it's a good, uh, a good principle as we go into 2023 to take forward alongside many of these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you, and that was an incredibly rich presentation. And thanks to you and your team for all the work that you've done uh, on that. Um, so we're very um, concerned about the trust and reputation of, of the industry. And I'm interested in what you said on your last slide about political stakeholders having an awareness of the industry's uh, contribution to regional economies and to green finance uh, and others. But last year, we had this feedback that actually, in terms of the industry's help, uh, to the public during the pandemic that somehow the industry was claiming too much credit. Mm. So how, you know, how do we strike the right balance? Uh, I'm hearing this year but, uh, that actually policymakers want us <laughs> to be more upfront about yeah. what we're doing and the co positive contribution we make. What, what's your advice uh, about getting that right? Yeah, well, the one advice I'm sure we all are aware of sometimes is you can't please everyone. So there's probably always going to be someone who says the opposite each, each year. But I do think what we learned last year and that remains very important is that it's about partnership. It's about coming together with policymakers. They recognize that the finance and related professional services industries have a huge amount of power. Have, and, and as such, if they can work together, that can be a really great benign power together to understand how the policymakers can sort of implement the right things, be educated on the right things to make a difference that also can then be sort of taken forward and there can be an engine of, of, of movement with that within the industry. So it's 
it's a bit about kind of working together to have the right roadmap to, to achieve the shared goals around what it is the industry can be, can be doing. Because a lot of policymakers say, I'd like to know more about what they can do and how they can do it, and then kind of work together on, on that. And I don't think they, they feel as comfortable when it's seen as a real separate set of actions. Mm -hmm. No, that's really helpful. And then maybe I could ask about the dreaded B word, uh, which <laughs> hadn't, hasn't uttered its name for so long. But, you know, recently, certainly business, both in our industry, but also more broadly, uh, you saw it at the CBI coming up. Brexit is more of an issue again, mm. certainly for business. Are you, are you sensing that um, from the public too in some of the broader research that you're doing? I mean, as we, as we saw in the slide at the very beginning, when we asked the public who do they feel is behind rising costs? Brexit was in there. And I think amongst the public, there has been a level of sort of concern and, and annoyance when in their everyday lives, they see Brexit impacting them. if something that all of a sudden becomes difficult. But there's so many other things going on at the moment for the public that it's just one aspect. You know, they also think the war in Ukraine has caused a huge amount of issues. They're also concerned about the, the government response to many things. You know, there's been so much going on, so much instability this year. So I don't think it's top of mind for mm. the public at all. I think for small businesses, it's still been an issue. But again, there's so much going on impacting small businesses. I think for your, your sort of average SME member of the public, Brexit is not something that is, is top of mind for them at the moment. It's a good corrective for us, I guess. <laughs> um, now, I'm looking at the audience. I have one question from the online audience, so don't let the online audience beat you to the first question. If there's any, oh, look, I've got a hand up over there, and then I'll go to the iPad. Yes, please. Please say it if you don't mind introducing yourself as well. Th thanks, Emma. It's Alistair Ross from the Association of British Insurers, and we've, we've had a lot of good um, and really interesting stuff from Carol in the past, so big fans, love all your work. Um, the, the, I think it was the second last slide you put up. You, you had a line there about um, saying, meet policymakers where they are rather than where you want them to be. And I just wonder if you could expand on what that meant a little bit more. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for the feedback on our work as well. It's always good to work with, with, with you too. Um, I think because I do a lot of this research, talking to lots of different people in different sectors and the people that they hope to influence or partner with, it's always quite a good reminder to almost sense check yourself that you get used to certain ways of talking, certain levels of institutional knowledge, certain assumptions can be made that we're, we're doing this, for example, some of the quotes up there from policymakers about, you know, they are investing in this area, I sort of know about it, do other people. And I think it's good to sense check yourself often as an industry of are we actually clearly communicating what we're doing and what are the issues in language that is clearly understood, thinking about all of the different sources of information and decisions and issues that policymakers are, are juggling every day. Is it as actually as clear as possible to them what you're doing, the benefits, for example, in the regions that they have? Um, and for some, yes, because some are really engaged in the sector, but many others are not. And some that I spoke to said they'd like to have more engagement or they'd like to have more information. And it has to be in a language, in a, in a simple way that they can really decode as what does this mean for me, what does it mean for my constituents. I think that's what we mean by that, that don't just assume you know where they are or what they know, uh, but always keep working to sort of test yourself that you're being as, as clear as possible and keep banging the drum of what you're achieving because that's the way it keeps getting heard. Well, we've got a related question to what you've just said actually from the online audience. Um, the regional developed figures were fascinating, so the, the different... Uh, figures about trust and reputation across mm. the different regions and nations of the UK. Should industry make more of local pride in industry, mm. industry success where that's possible? That might be a short answer to that one, but <laughs> given your <laughs> response. I mean, so I guess, I guess with the question of that, should we do more of sort of digging into those local stories? Is that mm. what I mean? I mean, I think absolutely. And, I, and I, think, I think, again, it's how do you communicate them effectively? I mean, I've done some work for firms for a very large firm over the years and was up in Glasgow quite often doing it because I had a base in Glasgow. And you know in Glasgow there, there are certain you know, brands that are in the, in the retail finance that people will talk about. They know what's happening. But do other people. So there is that thing about how do you harness those local narratives, those local stories. Maybe it's fine they're just celebrated regionally. But I think mean, there probably could be more that could be done that it's about really bringing it together and, 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 and celebrating that story. Because I think policymakers did say, I think partly because of the city UK, one of the quotes saying, like, they keep telling me there's jobs outside of, of, of London. 
But people do think in stories, actually. They mm -hmm. like statistics, but they really think in stories. So giving them those stories is a way that, that will really land. And so stories of, of, of regional pride, of regional benefits, it does make a difference. And I'd like to say thank you to our members because um, that's something that Britain Thinks has told us before. And we built a bank of case studies because we do find that they're more effective even than some of the statistics because they are more real to people. And I think this question goes to that as well. And then I'll come back out to the audience. How much do people connect the macro things that the, this industry does, tax contribution, jobs, exports, with its ability to help customers with the day-to-day, -day, such as mortgages, savings mm -hmm. for retirement, insuring their homes, and so on? And is it possible to connect these, or are they two separate audiences? That is a great question. Um, I should say I do a lot also consumer research on, on retail finance. And, and my, I mean, I've interviewed probably hundreds of people about their finances over the years. And um, in my experience, they don't connect that at all. They interface through the, through the sort of touch points which they're making their assessment of the industry is those ones that they have direct contact. So they are banking app, the products that they are using, the service that they receive. And it might actually be quite helpful, but it's probably quite challenging to try and make some of those connections. I mean, actually thinking about work for the ABI and insurance, you often find with the public, they don't even really understand how insurance works. They think I pay for my insurance, it's like my product, not that it's a kind of pot that people have gone into. So there's a lot of, and, and fair enough, you know, that's the thing about checking ourselves. I also think I mentioned do lots of work with, with the FCA and other brands, and some have to say like, your average consumer on the street, they're not stupid for not knowing these things. They've got busy lives, they're focused on other things, they work in other sectors, they've got families that they don't really understand how the system works. And I think there isn't, there is, there is something that needs to be thought through, I think, of how much is that problem with, for example, the consumer duty? How much do we need to be making sure people understand that, the, the broader uh, system and structures? Are, and how much do we think doesn't matter, actually? Where is that kind of is the right point, the right level of knowledge? So consumers feel that they're getting the right service, they understand the system, but aren't actually overloaded with information they don't need to have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Can I see any? Oh, hand here. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Boscott from the Fairlife Charity. Uh, you were saying that when the industry does well, it's important to communicate that to the public. Um, over the course of this year, the estimate is that the industry is spending something like 2.3 billion pounds implementing consumer duty, <laughs> which is a massive uplift for the public. Would you like to see that message communicated better to the public? The message of the investment in the consumer duty or what that's going to benefit? The, the impact yeah. of, con so yeah. to quote Robin Feith, who's the CEO of the Building Societies Association, most of the public will probably never hear of consumer duty, yet the industry is doing yeah. all this work to treat customers fairly. Well, I actually did some of the research that informed the consumer duty, so you can blame me. Um, <laughs> but I think actually it is based on some really sound principles of what we keep hearing the public really want. To the earlier point, do they need to know all the mechanisms behind it? If they feel they are getting better outcomes and they are being better informed, then I think that is, that is good for developing increased trust. I think also there is a, a higher level of trust now than you would have seen 10 years ago anyway. A lot of people, particularly with their own banks, their own providers, are, are quite trusting. So I think we sh the time will tell with how things pan out, but the, the principles behind it are, are quite sound. And I think it sh if it does help enhance um, consumer experiences, then that, that will be a good thing. And it's, and that's the, it's the stories again, too. Consumers don't really need to know about all the, the policies behind things, but if they have stories of how people are being helped and how to make the right decisions and what I call cognitive friction, so the friction people encounter when they just don't understand if the product they have is right for them, if that can be minimised, I think that's a real win for the public in enhancing trust and reputation. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Sandy Begbie mentioned earlier the task force on socioeconomic uh, diversity in, in our industry, which I was a member of it, actually concluded yesterday with a set of recommendations both for firms uh, and trade associations and, uh, and regulators. Um, there's a question here that goes to that issue, uh, which came out in your research, which um, it was about elitism mm -hmm. and the idea that lots of people from the industry, particularly at the senior levels, uh, come from a certain elite and so the question from the online audience was how do we best address the elitism accusation and how can we shift the perception in the most effective 
way. We might need to shift the reality first, but I, I, I don't want to answer this question myself, but over to you. That is a really good question. And, you know, I would also say that many, I mean, mo many sectors are grappling with it. I think the finance and related professional services sectors are particularly held up to, to you know, as a, as a sector where people can do well financially, for example, and maybe seen as particularly closed. But actually, even the market research industry is grappling with how do we become more open? There's an awful lot of people who have gone to Rossley universities are in that as well. And how do we become more open is a challenge many um, industries are, are grappling with. But I think we've got to keep doing it. We've got to keep challenging ourselves. Um, going back to that point that this is a really powerful industry, so many opportunities, small differences, incremental differences can make a huge difference to people's lives. And that's why I think it's sort of so important and trickle down to that positive reputational impact. So I don't think there's a simple answer, sadly, but I do think it's really important to challenge ourselves, to bring people in who are perhaps from different backgrounds as consultants to think about ways to do it, to hear from others who've done it, um, and just never rest on your laurels um, mm. about you know, how can you be more inclusive and think about, it, about opening things up. Great, thank you. I think there's a big focus on the industry on that, and it was great to hear Sandy talk about it earlier. Uh, any other questions from the audience? We're into the last few minutes. Anyone got any burning desire for a question? Okay, well, I've got a couple here. Um, I thought this was a really good question, given that you do research for lots of uh, market research for lots of different sectors. Uh, it was good to see the progress that we've made since the global financial crisis. Is there any other industry that has successfully reinvested its reputation? I thought it was an interesting phrase. Uh, improved its reputation markedly, I suppose. Um, and are there any lessons we could learn from, from that industry or sector? Mm, that is a really good question. And I think looking at trust sort of trackers that other sort of global companies do, which I look at quite often, we see a similar pattern that actually trust has increased for many sectors across the board, where it's actually decreased was, uh, I think, government and the, the clergy. So that's, uh, but over the years, many sectors have had an uptick in, in, in trust in them, which is positive, I think, showing many of the measures that corporations are taking. I do think having a sort of value proposition that helps people in their daily lives does help, which actually, just for example, you know, banking and, and finance does. But through the pandemic, for example, food distribution had a real uptick in, in people kind of realizing how complex that can be, how important it is to their lives. And so you can sort of see through, through societal trends a new appreciation of, of certain sectors. Um, but actually, perhaps the good news is that generally there's a, a slow but steady upward tick in, in trust across a whole range of sectors, including finance. Oh, that's very, that's very good to hear. Uh, very one last question for me, otherwise I'm going to get in trouble. Um, I thought this was a good question. Um, the industry talks about the good things that it's doing, for example, in ESG, uh, but this can turn into ac accusations of greenwashing uh, or manipulation. And how can we thread the needle of communicating what we're doing well when there is a general public perception that we aren't credible in certain areas? That's a really good question too. I think um, in this day and age, it's very difficult not to be criticised. There will always be someone who will be criticising. And I think, therefore companies, organizations, sectors have to be clear what they're going to stand for, what they're going to do and stand true to that and not be put off course too much by however the wind blows of certain opinion, which will disappear quickly. And we all see on social media, I don't think you can ever do anything that will be universally liked nowadays. So actually don't worry so much about that. I think figure out what you really feel is right. Go back to that point, be trustworthy. Think about what is the right thing we're going to do and stay true to that. And you may get accused of greenwashing or whitewashing, but if you really feel it is the right way forward and often there's an understanding of a lot of complexity, then stick with it because also those opinions will dissipate quickly. Thanks so much. And I, that's been a really rich discussion. And I, I just want to say how much the City UK appreciates our partnership with uh, Britain Thinks. And it really sometimes is a good corrective to the sorts of things that we are discussing with our members internally as well. And sometimes, you know, we, we need that uh, external uh, validation or correction from, from others, particularly from the public, but also from policymakers. So thanks, Carol, for all the work that, that you've done. And, and thanks for this morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.